Welcome to the WellStack podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Rossick, the director of WellStack Content and Solutions. In this episode, I'm joined by Carl Richards. Many of you know him as the New York Times sketch guy, but he's also the chief brand officer of Elements, a new tech firm taking the financial planning world by storm. Carl, thank you so much for joining me. Shannon, super excited to chat with you today. I feel like I can't encapsulate everything that you do and who you are in a little intro like that. You have such a fascinating background, so really appreciate you taking the time. But before we dive into all things elements, um, you know what's coming first, folks. So welcome to segment one of the podcast called Stats All, folks. So Carl, I wanted to talk about 1%, specifically the 1%. You know, Element CEO Reese Harper uh, said that traditional tools were built for the 1%, but we're building for everyone. Love the ambition, but what is meant by everyone and being the new player on the block? Can you explain who your advisor target market is? Yeah. I mean, Shannon, listen, I've heard the story over and over. It's the same story I told, which is I didn't get in and advisors tell me this. So it's just at XYPN, you know, any of these conferences, I get approached by advisors who say, I didn't get into this business to calculate the best way to deduct the private jet. Right. But I quickly found myself doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but I quickly found myself doing it. And the question always is like, what happened to the dream of impact? How can I serve more people? And the reason we get pushed up market is because we've never had the tools to profitably serve more people. Right. Because those tools were those tools were designed for the top of the market. Right. We use language like wealth management and private wealth private wealth and f private family office. So we were intentional about the idea that sure, if you want to calculate the deduction on the private jet, great. And we want to give you a tool that will allow you to serve profitably, serve everyone, more people, because we know that in order to grow businesses and have a broader impact, we're going to have to go downstream. Oh, absolutely. So ideal client wise, you know, what are you looking at in terms of advisors themselves? Is there a specific benchmark or is it really, truly everyone? Yeah, we, we have, I, I had the exact same question when Reese approached me about getting involved. I was like, oh, is this a cute toy for small <laughs> clients? Right. The answer is no. Like we've seen that it, it gives you the flexibility to the elements, gives you the flexibility to help everyone. But particularly on the high end, I've actually been quite surprised. And I think you and I both know this, right? People who are busy and successful, can you just can you just give it to me quick, right? Can you boil it down? Can you give me an executive summary? And elements, particularly the elements and the scorecard feature of the of the tool, allow us to quickly give people a picture of where they are so they can make fast decisions with the information they need. So another stat I want to throw at you is 64%. Um, I actually saw a recent study from ReachStack stating that 64% of clients hear from their advisor less than four times a year. So obviously that seems a little alarming, especially with money and investing being such a complex and emotional topic. You know, How is technology ultimately helping bridge that communication gap and what is Elements doing specifically? Yeah, I, I think two at least two things come to mind. Well, first of all, we have to fix that, right? I mean, that that might be one of the reasons we have the reputation at, that we do speaking broadly, right? Like people aren't typically happy with their experience with the financial services industries. Again, not to our audience, everybody loves your audience, you know what I mean? But speaking broadly, people aren't happy. We've got to fix that stat. And largely, I think that might be a reflection of the last couple of years being hard, you know, like we didn't know what to say. And so one of the things we want to make it easier for is to give you structured conversations, ways that, you know, a specific topic. Can I have a set of financial metrics that are objective and standard so that I can have something to talk about? And can I do it where clients live? Like this is a mobile first app, right? That allows people and by mobile first, that's like, I always like, oh yeah, 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 whatever. No, actually it's not a website optimized for your phone, it's actually built to be usable on your phone, right? And so the ability to communicate there via simple text message or in-app messages or however else you want to do it, pick up the phone and have a chat and giving you a topic to talk about. The reason advisors aren't reaching out is because they don't know what to say, right? So that's one of the things we're helping with. 
So moving on from stats, I want to get into the meat of this episode's episode's topics. And one of my favorite quotes from you, and as I introed you as the sketch guy, you, you famously said sketches are conversation grenades. And I agree. They're a great conversation starter that often leads to, you know, something deeper and more meaningful, but it feels like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that our industry in particular is going through this a bit of an awakening of how important it is to actually, um, you know, create these environments where they can facilitate these types of conversations, no matter, you know, the client's AUM, wherever they are in their financial journey. But why has it been so difficult for this industry to foster these types of conversations? It seems quite obvious at the end of the day that you should be facilitating things like this. Yeah, doesn't it? Like it's, it, <laughs> I've, asked, I've asked the same question for years, but I, I think, I think the answer is just that we sometimes forget that we're humans too. And as humans, we have never been taught how to talk about money, right? We all know the crazy stat that you're far more likely to tell a stranger about your sex life than you are about your financial life. That's that's crazy to me, right? And we know money, sex, politics, and religion. All the fun we stuff. All, yeah. Yeah. We were all taught like, it, you never talk about that in polite company. No. And so I think just the ability to overcome that, but we've got to realize that Look, real financial advice happens in conversation, right? And it's never, we, your audience totally knows this, right? It's never the presenting problem that's the problem. It's behind it, right? It's a layer or two deeper. And the only way to get there is to get good at conversation. The good news is the trick, the only trick to being good at conversation is just to be curious, I, I mean, the good news is it's simple. I don't, I did not say easy, but it's simple. Big, well, there's a big difference between simple and easy, right? And sure. you've said before that, you know, emotions make money complicated and that money problems aren't math problems. Like that could really make people's heads spin. So, you know, how is Elements taking the complex subject of money and planning and turning that into a simple and even an enjoyable experience? Like I never thought I'd say those words together. <laughs> I, I know, true, right? Like, like nobody, I mean, the idea of having a tool that um, a, a financial tool, a tool that a financial advisor uses and using the term beautiful and elegant. Like one of the things we got a lot of comments on in our recent fundraising um, meetings was like, we actually, I heard more people say, oh my gosh, this tool is sexy. <laughs> and I was like, what? We can't, we don't say that about financial planning tools. So I think um, here's one thing that's really important. And as I've talked to my friends, particularly in the medical field, right? When we walk through the idea of 12 objective financial vital signs, my friends in the medical field are like, what are you talking about? This didn't exist before, right? Because we all know, like it's been all my training for 25 years was like, have a hunch, buy a bunch, you know, a bunch of feelings or plug it into a calculator and generate 92.7% confidence ratios. Like, no, but what, what, what if I just want to know, like, how much money do I just spend? Like, what's my liquid term? How long could I go? So wrapping these things up in 12 financial vital signs, and then wrapping that further in a beautiful thing we call a scorecard actually gives us an, object, an objective place to anchor the conversation, which I think makes it much simpler. Like, where am I today? Am I going to be okay? Like much simpler than let me show you how we ran 37,000 scenarios, right? Much simpler. Oh yes. That's when the, the glazed donut look happens, right? Like, okay, exactly. great. I, ju I just want to know if I'm going to be okay. And if I can retire and, you know, enjoy the things I want to enjoy, but I want to go back to something you said that the 12 uh, financial vital signs, I want to dive into that a little bit more. So what are you particularly looking at with those? Um, what are some of them? Yeah. So my, let me just walk you through my favorite, which is liquid term, right? So liquid term just takes your liquid assets. It takes your, um, your spending or your burn rate sorry, liquid assets divided by spend in a monthly number. So, and sorry, in an annual number. So if you have a liquid term of one, that means you have one year of liquidity in the bank. That's my favorite one because it's so easy for us to see. And this is one thing we're kind of excited about as we learn about the interaction between different elements, right? And how people feel. There's this sense, Reese particularly has this sense that a liquid term of one one year, right? 
is a place at which, so a liquid term of 0.5 would be six months. A liquid term of one would be one year. Is it around one year is this place where we start to feel a little flexibility, a little freedom, a little enough, right? It might be a place where you can consider, do I want to make a job change in a job? Like those are the kind of thing, the kind of conversations that we can generate. In fact, let me give you a quick example. I just had somebody ask me a question the other day. She, they bought a piece of property. They wanted to know, and imagine this advisors, right? Like they wanted to know, this is somebody I met on an airplane. They wanted to know if they should build a small little, like almost cabin on the second, this piece of property they bought or a bigger house. I can now say, thanks for the question. Let me invite you to a tool that I use to help people answer those questions. So rather than saying, hey, Shannon, I need 24 months of brokerage statements and two years of tax returns in the DNA of your oldest child and your 17 point risk tolerance questionnaire, I can say, Shannon, thanks for the question. Let me invite you to this tool I use. And if you'll take 10 minutes, we found on average, 10 minutes, if you'll take 10 minutes to fill out a couple of questions, it will, the tool will generate 12 financial vital signs wrapped up in the scorecard. Well, when I got it back, we look and um, liquid term. So it's like, where would you get the money? I would take it from my savings account. Ah, so your liquid term would drop from one to 0.5, like about six months of liquidity. And I could tell her quickly, like, how do you think you would feel with six months of liquidity? Generally, people feel a little stressed. She's like, yeah, yeah, I think I'd feel that way too. Well, what if instead we got your LT score, your liquid term score up to 1.5? And once we get it there, you use that 0.5 for the house. Because I tell you, if you go down to 0.5, you're not going to feel super relaxed while hanging out, the, hanging out of the house, right? So I could quickly, with just a few minutes of my time, get to a point where I could add value before the, she wasn't even a client yet. Right. So that that's that's an example of one of the scores and exactly how we use it. Well, I think that's a great example and use case of, you know, how Elements is working for clients. And I've seen the Facebook ads everywhere uh, that Elements is actually now offering a one page plan and going back to your sexy comment. And I know you're calling it the OPP, obviously not to be confused with naughty by nature, but that obviously right. ladders up to the overarching theme of simplicity. What's the ultimate goal of the OPP and what are the benefits for advisors and their clients? Yeah, I, I just, we put so much pressure on these financial plans. Um, it, it's almost like we feel like they're going to be carved in stone. And the one page financial plan idea is just simply to try and point ourselves to the idea that fi the financial plan doesn't matter at all without the ongoing process of planning. And we know, the only thing we know for sure about your cute financial plan, and I'm talking to myself here, is that it's wrong, right? We just don't know how. And so the one-page plan is really just generated to help suggest to, the, to our minds, the advisor, and to the clients that this is an ongoing process. It's a relationship, not an event, right? This is all what advisors want, right? It's a relationship, not an event. It's a process, not a product. And that's what the one page plan does is like, we can keep coming back to it. It's a simple like statement of financial purpose, like mine on the top of it, it says time with my family, mainly outside and serving in my community and my church. And then it's got a list of my goals, right? And then it's got some simple metrics on where I am, of course, the, the scorecard, et cetera. It's something that I can reference. It becomes a touchstone when I'm thinking about doing something silly. I can pull it up again and remind, oh yeah, that's right. I said time with my family, mainly outside. Right. So that's, that's the idea. We have to just keep bringing clients back. That's one of the job of an advisor is to remind them what they said in their words, preferably remind them of what they said when they're thinking about doing something silly. And the place for that is the one page plan. So it's really more of an evergreen document too, because I would imagine things change over time and you, you need, as an advisor, you wouldn't want to overwhelm your client and say, Hey, let's look at this every month and see, see where you are. But it is, like you said, it goes back to that kind of just a touch point. That's kind of always living and breathing, if you will, during that relationship between the advisor and client, right? Yeah, totally. That's one, one of my goals is that the client will reference it when they call, like, and we even get like over time, clients get used to the idea of like, oh yeah, I know what they're going to tell me when I call. I, they, I should look at my one, but they're going to pull out the one page plan. So the idea is just like, that's where it lives. And of course, yeah, as you referenced, it changes over time. And I, I think we need to do a better job of uh, 
helping clients understand that that is part of the process. There's a sense in our industry that if the, like we've become defenders of outdated maps instead of guides in changing landscape. And we feel like, like we drew this map. It's so beautiful. We call this map a financial plan. And then if it turns out to be wrong, which it absolutely will be, like just go back and look at what your assumption was for inflation this year, right? I, I promise you it wasn't 8%. Like it was 3.1. Mm -hmm. You know, go back to go back to January of 2020 and tell me what your financial plan said you'd be doing in June. You know what I mean? So if we can just emphasize, this is a flexible document where actually what we get paid for is the course corrections, right? To be there when things change. We don't need to feel guilty when things change. It wasn't carved in stone. It was written in pencil. So I think that's super important to, to remember. And in a similar vein, it's really no secret that advisors spend a lot of time, quote unquote, you know, nudging their clients to follow up on action items, especially after initial meetings. And we are seeing several merging tech firms kind of crop up trying to streamline uh, for that issue. So what makes Elements kind of nudge capabilities different or better than any other kind of CRM providers and other planning providers out there? Yeah, well, I, I think first of all, it's it's simple based on a set of 12 objective financial vital signs that we call the elements, right? And then, so you've got to have, in order to nudge, in order to nudge effectively, you've got to know where you are. You know what I mean? Like we got to agree that this is a picture of current reality. And then we've also got to have some sense of here's the direction we want to go. And then right? Those nudges need to show up in a way in, in both a time and relevance and a place that matters. And so that's why we think the thing that you hold in your hands is the way to pull that off. And it wouldn't it be cool too, if it was really well designed and you, as we've been told, sexy, like it, it was, it was actually an experience that you enjoyed rather than something where you're like, oh, geez, this again. So that, that's why our focus has been on building a beautiful, engaging experience for the client. Well, I appreciate you taking a deeper dive into all things elements. And now it's time for segment two of this episode, Ask Us Anything, where I've gone out to the social universe and asked them to submit questions that they want answered by you. And they have delivered. Uh, I've been noticing a trend of people kind of sliding into the DMs. So I did get a few. Um, and first question uh, that I had somebody reach out and ask was, are there any concerns, and we touched on this earlier, but any concerns over mobile phone fatigue, which I think is really interesting because just about everything we do is on our phones or through an app now. It's how we communicate because it's all on our terms. Yeah, I mean, I think there's deep concern about mobile fatigue if, and I think the concern comes from, I, I think that concern is awesome because it places the burden on the designer of the product, right? The tool, the app to make sure that that's not the experience. It's a little bit like email fatigue, right? Like nobody reads emails anymore. Really? You read the ones you know are going to be relevant. So if we can make the experience beautiful, I don't think that's a concern. I, I think it. You're. we know we're not going back, right? Like, I, I don't know what you would do. I, I've actually tried lately to get rid of my phone, but I can't open my garage. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I can't drive my wife's car. So like I, there are, so I think we're going forward. So the burden really is like, well, you better be thoughtful about the design and the interaction. You better not be hitting people. I mean, if it turns out to be like just another Facebook with 72 messages a day, then of course delete. So yeah, I think that's important and a really good question. And another one we had was, and after doing, I was looking around this, the website and just reading up on elements, but um, somebody did actually notice the theme of kind of avoiding the words financial planning when it comes to elements. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, Shannon, I, I'd be curious about your perspective on this. Like I went back and looked. So my New York Times column ran every week for 10 years. I got thousands and thousands of emails from our, our like our target market as advisors. I never, not one time, did anybody ever ask me for a financial plan. Never. <laughs> And they certainly that didn't ask me something. for, a, yeah, they certainly didn't ask me to like do wealth management or build them a family <laughs> office. Like nobody, nobody uses those words. You know what they ask me? They ask me financial questions. Mm -hmm. Like, should I refinance? How do I invest my 401k? What do I do with this pool of money from the liquidation of my business? Like those kind of questions. So 
I don't think people, I don't even know that what we do is actually planning, right? Like I, I think it's guidance. I think it's monitoring, you know, I, I think it's goal setting. Um, so that's why we, that's very intentional and really astute of whoever observed that. <laughs> well, it, it's just interesting because there, we have so much jargon, as you know, in this industry. And at the end of the day, when you peel back the layers, people just want to be talked to like people, like you're having a conversation, you know, at a bar or on the couch with somebody and no one's walking up to you and being like, well, here's my planning, you know, all that. So it's just really interesting. And like I said, we're almost this reawakening, like people don't want to be talked to like that at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, nobody wants to hear your elevator pitch. You no. know what they want? They want an answer to a question. Like, why can't we give it to them? Why can't, why do we have to say it depends? Give me two years of tax. Return. Why can't we give it to them? So that we don't, we're not, we're not trying to be financial planning, right? We're trying to help you help clients, right? That like, we want to change the world. We don't want to do financial. If planning is something that helps change the world, great. But that's not our intention. Our intention is to change the world. Makes sense. Well, I appreciate you being put on the spot and, and your insightful answers. And we've come to our final and probably my favorite segment. I always have to end with something fun. So welcome to Stack It or Whack It, Carl, where I'm going to throw out a few technologies, not necessarily wealth tech related. And you tell me if it's worth the hype, essentially stack it or whack it. So I've I been waiting <laughs> my whole life for this, Shannon. The stack oh. it or whack it opportunity. So excited. <laughs> Let's go. All right. Well, number one, gamification in financial services. You see this really kind of more in the banking sector, but it seems like it's more challenging for the wealth managers to adopt. Thoughts? <laughs> that's like, that's like uh, I, the way it's being done, whack it. You know, like the, the concept stack it, right? Like the idea of making something engaging and, um, nudged, you know, like just using all the, all the, um, all the things we've learned about behavior and change, of course, but the idea of like, it reminds me, yeah, it reminds me of greenwashing. It reminds me of a lot of things that we've tried. Like, let's just help design intentionally for the change that we hope to create. And if that's called gamification, fine, but not the way it's been done. Well, I, I will agree with you on that. So number two, obviously outside of being an author and an illustrator, an artist and a CFP, you know, you're a creator at the end of the day. So what are your thoughts on NFTs? Stack it or whack it, or we haven't even scratched the surface. <laughs> Gosh, it's so good. Cause they're the same. Like, like, whack, 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 whack it based on that, like what happened. But the underlying concept is so beautiful. Like mm -hmm. the idea that I could have some simple way of showing ownership and the way that, that as a digital creator, somebody could own instead of just consume, but could own an asset that I create. And that, that would then as ownership, they could transfer that ownership to somebody else is really, really cool. We just have a, a ways to go in terms of making that easy and to be honest, like easy and reliable for people. Yep. Hey, it all goes back to being easy and simple, right? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you indulging me and I, I might have to have you come up with a, a sketch to explain NFTs. <laughs> I've yet to exactly. figure that out. So yeah. if you have a way around that, I would love to see it. Uh, yeah. But Carl, thank you so much. Really enjoyed our conversation. We've covered a lot of ground. So please feel free to tell listeners where they can find out more about Elements. Yeah, the easiest way is just go to the website, get Elements. That's getelements.com and book a demo right? Come and see. Don't believe me. Go actually see the product for yourself. Perfect. So if you want to stay ahead of the technology status quo, don't miss our WealthStack event, part of Wealth Management Edge, May 21st through 24th in Hollywood, Florida. And be sure to follow us on all social media platforms, especially LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you all for listening and have a great day. 